Challenging Amazon Normativity, Part 2, Digging Deeper. Order of Content. We will start with a list of basic definitions and an explanation of what Amazon Normativity is. Then we will go through the ways in which Amazon Normativity intersects with different systems of oppression. We will then go through a series of exercises. To round off, we will go through a list of sources and the credits. Definitions. These basic definitions will be helpful as you go through the guide. 1. Ableism. The discrimination and prejudice against disabled people, or a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normality, intelligence, excellence, desirability, and productivity. 2. Aphobia. Discrimination against or fear of asexual or aromantic people. 3. Cis-heteropatriarchy. A system of power based on the supremacy and dominance of cisgender heterosexual men through the exploitation and oppression of women and the LGBTQI plus community. 4. Colonial sexuality or settler sexuality. A white national heteronormativity that regulates indigenous sexuality and gender by supplanting them with the sexual modernity of settler subjects. 5. Desirability politics, a methodology through which the sovereignty of those deemed conventionally attractive, beautiful, or arousing is determined. 6. Endogamy, marriage within a specific group, such as a racial ethnic group, as required by custom or law. 7. Curiarchy, the social system that keeps all intersecting oppressions in place, or the set of connecting social systems built around domination, oppression, and submission. 8. Lookism, prejudice or discrimination based on physical appearance. 9. Sanism, the assumption that there is one way for human brains and human minds to be configured and to function, and that there is something wrong with those who deviate from this. 10. Western colonialism, the political economic phenomenon whereby various European nations conquered, settled, and exploited large areas of the world. 11. White supremacy. Beliefs and ideas purporting natural superiority of the lighter skin or white human races over other racial groups. What is amateurnormativity? Amateurnormativity is the assumption that a central, exclusive, amorous relationship is normal for humans, and that it is a universally shared goal, and that such a relationship is normative, and that it should be aimed at in preference to other relationship types. The assumption that valuable relationships must be marital or amorous devalues friendships and other caring relationships. Coined by Elizabeth Brake. In other words, amateurnormativity is a cultural belief that a relationship that is romantic and sexual is a most important type of relationship that can have, that this relationship should be long-term and monogamous, and that everyone wants and should have a romantic sexual relationship. Digging Deeper in part one, A Beginner's Guide, you began your journey on challenging Amazon normativity. You learned what Amazon normativity is, the various forms in which it manifests, and how it can be harmful. That was just the beginning. Amazon normativity is deeply embedded in our culture, institutions, and society, but it does not act alone. It's part of a web that underlies our society, intersecting with other oppressive systems. Much like the often invisible fungal networks that support and sustain forests, this web of cultural hegemony supports and sustains much of our current norms and structures. This affects how we think about, among other things, relationships, who deserves access to care, and even who is granted humanity or not. Amateurnormativity is therefore a part of the curiarchy, the social system that keeps all intersecting oppressions in place. Until we dig deeper, the tangled and deeply rooted web remains largely invisible and unchallenged. Content warning. This guide will address topics related to different types of oppression, including racism, sexism, and ableism, and there are mentions of abuse, transphobia, and dehumanization. Each section will contain the appropriate content warnings. 
If you have a lived experience with these and find it distressing, please proceed with caution. For those with privilege, this isn't an invitation to hide from difficult topics, however. Amateurmativity and its intersections. The following topics will be discussed individually, but they should not be considered independent. As part of the hierarchy, these systems overlap and feed into each other and are rooted in each other. When thinking about intersections with amateurmativity, a few things may come to mind first. Heteronormativity, homonormativity, singlism, and compulsory sexuality have clear connections with amateurnormativity. Perhaps the murkier intersections lie with white supremacy, colonialism, ableism, and capitalism. Additionally, these can merge to enable desirability politics, which are often cis-heteronormative, racist, classist, and ableist. The focus of these intersections will be on how they impact how we as a society do relationships and define care. This guide will therefore cover five topics. 1. White supremacy and colonialism. 2. The cis-heteropatriarchy. 3. Ableism. 4. Capitalism. And 5. Desirability politics. Afterwards, you can engage in a series of exercises to further examine and reflect on how these intersections show up in your life and in society around you, and how you can continue to challenge this. Disclaimer. This guide is not a comprehensive explanation of these systems, and it focuses on how these intersect with amateurnormativity. Amateurnormativity and white supremacy and colonialism. Content warning. Racism and colonial impacts. Mention of forced sterilization. White supremacy and colonialism have significant impacts on many social structures and systems, including norms around relationships, care, and desirability. One could argue that white supremacy and colonialism are the root of amateurnormativity rather than an intersection. One could further argue that white supremacy is the root of all, if not many, of the oppressive systems addressed in this guide, which is why we start with it. A facet of white supremacy and colonialism is colonial sexuality, also known as settler sexuality. White supremacy enforces the amateurnormative ideal that romantic sexual relationships should be long-term and monogamous through colonial sexuality. It also places romantic sexual relationships at the top of the hierarchy as exemplified through marriage while delegitimizing other ways of relating. Colonial sexuality is therefore inherently amazonormative. It's tied to being productive in the sense of reproducing and having biological children, the nuclear family, and privatization of property all of which are ideally accomplished within a marriage. As such, colonial sexuality was originally heteronormative. However, gay folks and other same-gender loving folks are now increasingly integrated into colonial sexuality and amateurnormative standards through homonormativity, as gay people gain access to and fit into this norm of getting married or having long-term partnerships and civil unions, having children, being homeowners, and so forth. White supremacy has also been controlling the sexuality and romantic sexual relationships, including marriage, of Black, Indigenous, and people of color for hundreds of years. Through colonialism, Western views of marriage, relationships, and sexuality have been forced onto BIPOC, often violently. Interracial relationships have also been controlled, such as through endogamy to ensure the purity of whiteness. BIPOC sexualities have been deemed primitive, and European settlers and colonialists view it as their mission to civilize them. As Gloria Wacker writes in White Innocence, quote, The complex sexual map represents the sexuality of Black people and other others as one that needs to be controlled, end quote. This desire to control BIPOC sexuality extended as far as forced sterilization. For example, Black women have been deemed unfit to be mothers because they're sexually indiscriminate. Many Black women were therefore sterilized without consent. Additionally, as marriage and monogamy were, and still are, deemed to embody moral superiority, these were often forced onto BIPOC as a way to civilize them. Amateurnormative standards such as monogamy and couple centrism 
have therefore been universalized through westernization and colonialism despite these not being the norm in other cultures Quote, people commonly assume as a result of amos normativity that monogamy is a universal norm and that marriage is simply a natural expression and beautiful solemnization of romantic love this is a false universality in non and pre-patriarchal societies the sexual exclusivity and long-term indefinite commitment of monogamy were never normative expectations through most of human history romantic bonds were commonly short-term and non-exclusive instead of couple centrism cultures without patriarchy and or land ownership commonly have extended caring networks and support structures where children are raised communally only about 17 percent of human cultures are strictly monogamous even today source one through the intersection of anti-normativity and white supremacy and racism non-normative ways of relating became deviant this is especially so for bipoc and or those in non-western societies for example polyamory may be considered queer in relation to colonial sexuality due to the amos normative ideals it engenders but in some indigenous cultures it's not considered queer as plural marriages were quite common it was and is simply another way of being and relating however colonial amos normative norms have been internalized through forced assimilation by some non-western cultures meaning that these norms can be perpetuated even within racial ethnic minority groups furthermore non-white racial ethnic groups are considered to deviate from the norms of desirability that govern romantic sexual relationships and marriage for instance asian men are desexualized black and latin folks are often hypersexualized indigenous folks are considered heathens these stereotypes on the sexualization of racial ethnic minorities can be more complex through intersection of age class and gender these are just simplified explanations any racial ethnic group that has a relationship structure that differs from the amazonormative western structure is considered backwards or primitive romance and amazonormativity are then used as tools for social control if people engage in monogamous long-term romantic sexual relationships epitomized through marriage they can be saved they can be considered respectable and worthy isabel wilkerson writes in cast the origins of her discontents that closing off chances for interracial marriage and romantic relationships through endogamy impeded opportunities for white folks to build empathy for bipoc while endogamy certainly prevented interactions between different racial ethnic groups and reinforce the place of white folks as the dominant group, we can also question why it is necessary to have marriage, romantic ties, or legal family connections for people of the dominant group and in general to have personal stakes in the well-being of others and to humanize them. Amateuromativity and the cis-heteropatriarchy Content warning Sexism, mentions of sexual harassment and violence, and mentions of queer phobia note women and men are used in an inclusive manner here unless otherwise stated such as with the use of cis woman or cis man many of the sexist norms discussed in this section do relate to cisgender roles however amateur normativity dictates that we should all be engaging in monogamous romantic sexual relationships while the cis heteropatriarchy dictates with whom and how we should engage in romantic sexual relationships Many expectations, norms, and behaviors around romance and romantic relationships are the result of amateuromativity, sexism, heteronormativity, and cisnormativity. Tied to colonial sexuality, the patriarchy decrees that romantic sexual relationships should only be between cis men and cis women, and that they should have particular roles within these relationships. Indeed, dating and romance are full of roles and practices related to cisgender roles and homophobic ideas surrounding romantic sexual relationships and the gender roles within them are still pervasive although this is slowly changing the norm is also that women should defer to their male partners and that it is the ultimate purpose of women to be solely responsible for meeting all the domestic emotional sexual needs of their male partners sexism and amateurmotivity lead to numerous toxic and abusive expectations and behaviors around romance, many of which are deemed normal or even romantic. For example, 
This is heteronormative idea that women should be demure and not be too easy. While men should do all the pursuing leads to romantic harassment, such as men who don't take no as an answer and are persistent in getting women to date them. Sexism and amorous romanticity also show up in how women are more often expected to have their lives revolve around romance and their male partners. Women who decide not to pursue romance are often shamed, whereas men might be able to remain single, relatively unscathed, because a greater portion of women's inherited worth is based on their ability to get a partner. Men's worth is also based on their ability to get a partner, but their worth is also determined by many other factors. Men are still mostly able to be whole, autonomous individuals without a partner, while women are inherently considered incomplete or unfulfilled without a partner. As part of relationship norms, the patriarchy and amatonormativity also influence how we as a society view sex and sexual relations. While this is changing, the prevailing view is that people should only be having sex in a committed romantic relationship and or marriage, which again ties back into colonial sexuality. Those who don't conform to these sexual norms are often sex-shamed as casual or non-partnered sex, are frowned upon or deemed as lesser, immoral, or not valid. Patriarchal norms and amatonormativity can also lead to sex entitlements and adversarial sex beliefs, in which it is believed that men and women are in competition for power in sexual relationships. Especially in romantic relationships, people often believe that they're entitled to sex, which can lead to sexual harassment, coercion, and even violence. Considering that the cis-heteropatriarchy decrees that romantic sexual relationships should be cis-heteronormative, transgender, non-binary, and other queer folks who are aloromantic or engage in romantic relationships often have to deal with their relationships being delegitimized. In fact, any kind of queer relationships, including non-romantic or non-sexual ones, are delegitimized for not fitting into the norm. However, many queer folks and communities may end up being hyper amateurative as a desperate attempt to assimilate into heteronormative society. As mentioned before, homonormativity brings queer folks into the fold of amateurnormativity. Nevertheless, this is a false sense of acceptance and inclusion, seeing as queer folks are still valued on their attractiveness and ability to find a partner, and how much they can measure up to the cis-heteronormative ideals. This emphasis on attractiveness and ability to find a partner, essentially the degree to how amateurnormativity one can be, can lead to transphobia, for example as trans folks are only deemed worthy if they're attractive, which in reality means that they should be able to conform to cis-heteronormative beauty standards and pass as cisgender. Amateurnormativity and cis-homonormativity can mean that passing trans folks turn against non-passing, which creates a wedge within the community. One extreme form of this is transmedicalism, which states that people not on hormones and or not seeking surgery as part of their transition are not really trans. This is also something that can be leveled at non-binary folks. Another extreme example of the legitimization of this is heteropatriarchy or the so-called trans panic pills. In many ways, they reveal the true power of amateurnormativity in the way that some perfectly natural identities are very clearly excluded from desirability and standard expectation. That there must definitely have been attraction until the victim trans identity was revealed. That some people's reactions to having these expectations challenged can be as extreme as murder. And that a sufficient number of people in wider society sympathize with this change in desirability and murderous reaction for it to be a law. Mainstream LGBTQ plus groups might end up reinforcing cis heteronormativity, homonormativity, and amatonormativity and in turn perpetrating transphobia and aphobia because of the focus on pursuing normative, monogamous, romantic sexual relationships. Amateurnormativity and ableism. Content warning. Ableism, sanism, pathologization, and mentions of eugenics, abuse, and aphobia. Note, ableism here will also encompass sanism. Amateurnormativity and ableism also intersect to influence with whom we engage in relationships and to whom we extend care. 
Receiving care is often dependent on being loved or desirable. It also influences who we humanize and who we consider worthy of receiving care. Disabled and neurodivergent folks and those who defy amateurmativity, such as aromantics and non-monogamists, have to contend with being dehumanized and or pathologized. Both are subjective to the idea that there's something inherently wrong with them and that they need to be fixed or cured. Oftentimes, the reason to cure someone is so that they can become eligible for romance. The ability to love is also considered a trademark of humanity by many. Some neurodivergent folks don't or can't experience love in socially recognized and accepted ways. For some, they may have experienced abuse in the name of love, or love was used to absolve the abuser of their wrongdoing, and they therefore don't associate with the concept of love. For others, their conceptualization and experience of love don't align with normative standards. Additionally, aromantics and asexuals are considered mentally ill for experiencing love non-normatively, or not at all, even if not neurodivergent. Those who can't or don't love in normative ways end up being dehumanized, because according to Amazon normativity, we should all engage in romantic love and relationships. It's what makes us humans, society says, and if you can't love, then you must be a monster. This view ends up isolating and alienating many people and it can prevent them from connecting with others. One shouldn't need to or be able to love in order to form connections and relationships with others. If we connect to colonial sexuality from earlier, disabled and neurodivergent folks are considered undesirable according to Amazon normative standards, because coupling up and having children, in other words, being reproductive, are tied to being a good citizen. Neurodivergent and disabled folks are then viewed as unfit to couple up and reproduce. History, modern medicine, and socio-political policies are rife with forced sterilizations, eugenics, and control over romantic sexual relationships of disabled folks to prevent them from passing on their, quote, bad genes, and or because of the view that they shouldn't be parents. Therefore, ableism automatically deems disabled folks as unable to meet amateurative standards. There is also infantilization wrapped up in both ableism and amateurativity that reinforce one another. Disabled people are viewed as childlike for needing different forms of care, and if they are aromantic or non-monogamous, the idea that they are not mature enough to have a normative relationship furthers this stereotype. Additionally, disabled folks are further removed from amateur normative expectations through structural means, in that they could risk losing their disability benefits if they get married or live with romantic partners. Amateur normativity also creates additional obstacles for disabled and neurodivergent folks. In an amateur normative society, much of care work is relegated to partnerships. The expectation is that a partner is often solely responsible for helping you meet your needs. For a disabled or neurodivergent person, this would also mean they're supposed to rely on a partner for help with daily activities. As a consequence, being unpartnered may be life-threatening, as many disabled and neurodivergent folks may end up not being able to access the help or care that they need, whether it's because they are not partnering or again because of the ableist notion that they aren't desirable as partners. Alternatively, they may be locked away in institutions where their rights may not be respected because they fail to meet the standards of humanity in an ableist and amateurative society. Quote, I think about the need for care that can be accessed when you're isolated, disliked, and without social capital, which many disabled people are. End quote. Source 11. Amateur Normativity and Capitalism. Note, romance discussed in this section does not necessarily refer to romantic attraction, but rather the social norms, behaviors, and expectations that surround romance and romantic love. The way we view and do relationships is also influenced by capitalism, which enables and enforces amateur normative standards. Romantic love, as we know it currently, is largely a product of capitalism, which has commodified human emotions. Romance and capitalism work together to convince us to work hard for a future payout, in other words, falling in love and securing a romantic partner. 
This is why studying or focusing on one's careers are often considered valid excuses for temporarily not pursuing romance. In fact, we're encouraged to get a degree or a well-paying job so that we can be a good spouse or parent. We're led to believe that modern romance is natural, and in reality, it's something that we're conditioned to do. We exist in an economy that depends on romance, and capitalism relies on the idea that romantic love is natural, that anyone can fall in love, and that it's all we need. This idea that love is all we need leads people to ignore social issues and to place their own happily ever after over the safety and security of our collective future. As most people spend their time and resources pursuing romance and coupling, they might end up spending little time addressing social issues. This puts a focus on the private lives rather than on community and global issues. It enforces the idea that we should abandon our communities in order to pursue romantic love. Quote, romance seduces us into privatizing our futures. End quote. Source 13. This privatization of our lives goes hand in hand with amatomotivity, which is especially exemplified by couplecentrism and the nuclear family. The exclusivity and monogamy normativity of amatomotivity perpetuates the insular romantic couple form. Society is divided into smaller nuclear family units, and we are led to believe that we can only receive care within our small units, which is further enforced by our social and institutional structures. Most of the responsibility of care ends up being placed within romantic partnership and the nuclear family rather than on the state. In addition to care, each household is expected to be dependent on its own material resources which result in capitalism benefiting from the nuclear family living on their own. Kinship networks and communities are often left out of consideration, as ideally we should deal with and manage our problems within the household. Having to enlist outside help, such as using welfare or social assistance, may be viewed as a sign of failure, that you aren't sufficient or productive enough on your own, with the exception of upper-class folks who hire help for domestic labor. This intersects with Emma's normativity because we're often forced to couple up in order to meet our needs. Think about how expensive it is to be single and how many fears we have around being alone because who will take care of us when we're sick or unemployed? This leads to care becoming commodified, childcare, elderly care, domestic work. Even self-care and well-being have been commodified. Capitalism, after all, relies on our domestic labor and care to ensure that we're well enough to keep working and producing, all of which is expected to occur within private and insular units. Rather than facing how our current social structures leave us vulnerable or focusing on developing communities and more expensive care networks, we are instead socialized to think that it's natural to want to couple up and conform to the nuclear family and that we don't have to consider the well-being of those in our wider community who don't do this. Amatonormativity and Desirability Politics Content Warning Mentions of racism, ableism, aphobia, transphobia, and implied lookism. Love is blind, but is it really? According to amatonormativity, we should all be pursuing monogamous romantic sexual relationships, and that is one of the most meaningful things we can do. As a result, people spend a lot of time making themselves attractive and desirable, whether physically, financially, or socially, when pursuing romance in order to find a partner. The desire to be seen as desirable is a strong motive in enforcing amatonormativity. Quote, Romance is one of the most disciplining mechanisms in society because it not only prohibits desire, but it also structures it. Source 14. End quote. We talk about love and attraction as things we can't help or control. The heart wants what it wants. However, romance, attraction, and what we find desirable can be influenced by socio political systems, and in turn, our desirability can be determined by our social position. This means that those with higher status, in other words, those who are in the dominant or norm groups, are most likely to be considered attractive. Quote, According to systems of oppression, the most desirable partner is one that fits in every single box, meaning they are white, 
middle class and upward, straight or straight passing, because this can also apply to LGB people, cisgender, thin, and able-bodied, end quotes, source 16. There is even a specific term for those who fit society's ideals of beauty and desirability, conventionally attractive. When romance and desire are treated as completely natural and innate, their socio-political and oppressive nature are ignored or buried. This is not to say that people don't or can't experience romantic attraction and desire naturally, but that romance at what we consider desirable can be socialized to some degree. For this reason, even movements that should be more liberatory in this regard, such as the queer movement, only reinforce the hierarchical structure of desire and their goal of attaining the freedom to love because it uncritically defends the idea that people can't help who they love or don't love. Therefore, the intersection of emotivity with white supremacy, cis-heteropatriarchy, ableism, and capitalism all feed into desirability politics. Even when romance and romantic inclinations are viewed as inherently pure, they can end up being oppressive and used to justify bigotry. Most people don't enter romantic relationships with those outside of their class or racial ethnic group. Disabled folks, people of color, and trans folks, especially those who don't pass, are often not considered attractive or partner material. People will swear that it's not because of racism, ableism, or transphobia, but that it's about compatibility. Additionally, people tend to view those who don't want to date or play the desirability game with suspicion. For example, people might attribute a romanticism and asexuality with undesirability or an inability to get a partner, thinking things like, you're just aromantic because no one wants to date you, or equating asexuality with being unattractive, unwanted, and undesirable. On the flip side, aromantic and asexual folks who are deemed attractive are often considered a waste, as if they're obligated to take part in dating, romance, and sex because of their attractiveness. Underlying a part of desirability politics is a fear of undesirability. When you don't fit in the standards of desirability, emotionality makes you feel like you're worthless because you can't live up to its ideals. There's even a fear of being seen with someone who is considered undesirable, as if undesirability were infectious. For this reason, a straight cis man might not want others to find out that he had sex with an unattractive woman, because it could be negative for his reputation. People fear not being desired and losing desirability just as much as they fear not finding someone to desire. Quote, At the very heart of romantic hierarchy, and the discrimination against those that must be deemed less worthy in order for it to exist is the fear of losing one's perceived place within the hierarchy. End quote. Source 17. Further challenging amatonormativity. Now that you're more aware of how amatonormativity interacts with other systems, you can begin to further challenge not only your own amatonormativity, but also society's amatonormativity. While it may not seem automatically obvious, all of these systems interact to impact how we do care and relationships. Emetonormativity is one piece of a hierarchy that is tightly enmeshed with other systems of oppression, which is why it's necessary to challenge it in an intersectional manner. For deeper change, we have to not only change the way we think about relationships and care on an individual level, but also drive change on a cultural and structural level. Take your time to reflect and complete the exercises. You might have to revisit certain exercises as you further digest the information. As part of the exercises, make sure to take a moment to read the narratives listed on their sources and narratives for further learning. Pre-reflection. Before starting the exercises, take a moment to reflect on how you feel after learning that amatonormativity is rooted in or intersects with white supremacy, colonialism, ableism, and capitalism. When confronted with the prejudices of a system deeply ingrained in our culture, we may experience and encounter difficult feelings that show up in our thoughts and bodies. Perhaps guilt from realizing that you are complicit in a system that harms others, tension from being confronted with hard truths, and or perhaps sadness from realizing how you yourself have been harmed. Sometimes challenging yourself can be hard and that's okay. 
What do you think about amatonormativity and its intersections? Do you experience any negative feelings, such as defensiveness, shame, tension, or guilt, anger, perhaps? Do you experience any positive feelings, such as recognition, release, understanding, or insights? As you move through this, feel free to pause and re-examine where you are. Pause here to write, record, or think about your response. Exercise 1. An important way to challenge amatonormativity is by changing the way you think about and do relationships. In part 1, you began this process, and now we will go a step further by examining how these intersections show up and how you do relationships, such as through desirability politics. You can use the following prompts to start, but feel free to explore other topics. Are your most important relationships based on level of romantic or sexual attraction, such that you prioritize relationships with those you are most attracted to? Is the care you provide dependent on attraction, love, or the desirability of the care recipients? Do factors like racism, transphobia, and ableism affect who you care for and with whom you engage in significant relationships? In what ways could the manner in which you engage in relationships uphold the status quo or perpetuate oppression? How do systems of oppression affect your relationships, the way you relate to others, and who you view as desirable? Pause here to write, record, or think about your response. Exercise 2. Another important aspect of challenging amateurmotivity is addressing the unrealistic or toxic expectations norms, and behaviors around romance that amatonormativity can cause. Because romance is put on a pedestal and is made out to be pure, many behaviors around it which may normally be considered unsafe or violating are excused. Many people do awful things in the name of love, but some of these things have been normalized or co-opted to be signs of a true romance. You can use the following prompts to start, but feel free to explore other topics. Have you ever felt entitled to being in a relationship with someone or having sex with someone because you had romantic feelings for them? If you haven't experienced this yourself, then do you believe that romantic feelings entitle people to being in a relationship or having sex with someone? How come? What would be a better way to view this? Think about some of the romance and sex norms mentioned earlier in the guide and how these intersect and relate to sexist and racist stereotypes. For example, which groups are most likely to be sex-shamed for having sex outside of committed romantic relationships? Likewise, which groups are less likely to be considered suitable romantic partners? Why do you think that is? How can you challenge that? In what ways have you noticed these norms show up in media or in life? How are they often portrayed? How could this be portrayed in a non-normative way? What kind of adverse consequences are normalized by toxic romance norms? How can you confront these? Pause here to write, record, or think about your response. Exercise 3. Now that you have examined how these intersections influence how you do relationships, we will also look at how to change this. This exercise introduces other ways of connecting to and being in relation with others. Redefining care is an important part of challenging amatonormativity such as basing care on trust and respect rather than attraction. As such, redefining care also entails challenging capitalism, white supremacy, the cis heteropatriarchy, and ableism, and centering marginalized ways of knowing and being, as exemplified in disabled, queer, and BIPOC communities to subvert the norms created and upheld by these systems. To begin, we'll introduce a couple of relationship and care philosophies and models. Relationship anarchy is a relationship philosophy that rejects any socially mandated labels, rules, and expectations around relationships. Some central tenets include anti-hierarchy, lack of state control, non-prescriptionist, anti-normativity, and community interdependence. It also does not divide or rank between platonic, sexual, romantic, or other forms of loves and intimacies that exist in wider society. With RA, each relationship should be discussed separately from expectations, assumptions, or prescribed labels to determine the structure, boundaries, and agreed-upon commitments. These principles pertain to any relationship, not just romantic partnerships, meaning that you can use RA for all of your relationships if you so choose. 
Each relationship is unique and customizable. For this, you can use the Relationship Anarchy Smorgasbord, which consists of activities and attributes that you and another person can mutually decide to include in your relationship. You can view them as building blocks for forming your relationship. You don't have to do everything within a block, though. For example, if you want to have social touch in your relationship, you can choose to only include hugs and holding hands, but not massages. You can see the Relationship Anarchy Smorgasbord on the screen, but you can also find it in the text versions of the workbook, and there's also alt text provided within the PDFs and Google Docs. Relationship Anarchy is inherently anti amateurnormative in that it is non-monogamist and does not place romantic relationships as the most important. As such, RA doesn't and shouldn't only challenge amateurnormativity on an individual level. Community interdependence is a key tenet of RA, exemplified by communities, not couples, which challenges couple centricity and coupledom, the nuclear family, and resists monogamy. These ways of relating lead to isolation and privatization of care, thereby leading to less support and increased vulnerability and chances of being exploited. Therefore, deprioritizing couples and partnerships and insular forms of relationships while prioritizing community and extended care networks are imperative to being a relationship anarchist. RA isn't just about doing individual relationships in a different manner, but about actively pushing for the resistance of the numerous interlocking structures of the hierarchy that enforce homosexuality, monogamism, the cis heteropatriarchy, and other assimilationist moves such as homonormativity and hierarchical polyamory. Community care and care webs are other important concepts in redefining care as they move support and care out of insular units, such as couples and nuclear families, into extended care networks. It acknowledges our interdependence and pushes us to take others' well-beings and needs into consideration. This is counter to capitalism and the pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps notion that we can be completely independent and self-reliant and only need to take care of ourselves. For this reason, it also challenges ableism as it normalizes asking for help and destigmatizes burdening others. Community care has been part of human existence for a long time, but has diminished as our society becomes more individualistic and privatized, especially for marginalized folks who can't rely on the state or nuclear family. Practicing community care is embedded into daily life and necessary for survival. Alongside self-care, which has been commodified and co-opted by neoliberal individualism, community care is crucial for our collective well-being. Quote, Community care is the foundation of togetherness. By cultivating it, we are better able to support our well-being and that of our loved ones. End quote. Source 21. Community care can be practiced on a smaller scale through care webs or pods, which are networks or groups of people who help each other out, regardless of the type of relationship they have with each other. On a larger scale, it can be practiced through activism, including advocacy, voting, or volunteering. Because this kind of care isn't based on attraction or whether or not you love someone, and because it challenges norms that it's only acceptable to rely on significant others, such as romantic partners, spouses, or the nuclear family, it engenders anti normative ideals. Mutual aid can be another vital tool in dismantling and disempowering amateurnormativity. Mutual aid is a structure and act of cooperation where aid is both given and received freely, and the hierarchy between those giving aid and those receiving it is rendered obsolete. This can look like something as small as helping a neighbor shovel the street and then getting gardening advice from them later on, to something as broad as international networks of solidarity. In Amazon normativity, much of the care we need is expected to come from a romantic partner. Emotional needs, housing, childcare, support during illness, among a few examples. This isolation of care to amateurnormative relationships serves to make living outside of amateurnormativity more difficult for people. Mutual aid can act as a tool to support people on spaces outside of amateurnormativity and serve to disempower the structural power it holds. It's important to note that mutual aid is not necessarily anti amateurnormative Aid given and received in monogamous romantic relationships doesn't challenge amateurnormativity. 
Even aid outside of that relationship structure can enforce amitonormativity if the aid is either implicitly or explicitly conditional on someone's conformance to amitonormativity. Mutual aid given and received outside of amitonormative standards and relationships can help build spaces beyond amitonormativity for people to survive and thrive. Take a moment to reflect on the differences between the standard amitonormative relationship and care philosophies, models, and practices and the philosophies, models, and practices that challenge amitonormativity. What are some examples you can think of? For example, with an amitonormative lens, relationship types are strictly categorized into romantic, platonic, familial, etc., and these divisions are considered inherent and natural. With an anti amitonormative lens, though, divisions between relationship types are dissolved. People are free to customize and form relationships based on personal and mutual agreements without adhering to categories. What are some other examples? Pause here to write, record, or think about your response. Exercise 4. Taking what you learned from exercise 3, try to incorporate them into how you engage in relationships with others. Take one of these concepts and apply it to your own life. For instance, sit down with someone important in your life and go through their relationship anarchy board. Create your own pod or perform some mutual care aid for your neighbors and local community. Once you've applied at least one of these to your own life, take a moment to reflect on the process. Have you ever done something like this before, especially with non-romantic or family relationships? Did you find any aspects of these challenging? If so, what aspects were challenging and why? How did you find the process and how did others react? Do you find yourself thinking differently about how you relate to others, engage in relationships, and provide and receive care? If so, what changed? Pause here to write, record, or think about your response. Exercise 5. While addressing amitonormativity and its intersections in our personal lives is an important step, we also need to reflect and work on these things at the group and structural level. What are some ways in which these intersections show up on our structural or institutional level, such as in policies or laws? These can include outdated and historical laws and policies. For example, North American assimilationist policies against indigenous peoples were linked with prohibitions against polygamy and attempts to dismantle flexible marriage patterns and extended kinship networks. Take a moment to search for other examples and write down your findings. Pause here to write, record, or think about your responses. Exercise 6. To take it a step further, in what ways can you challenge amitonormativity, including its intersections with colonial sexuality, capitalism, desirability politics, and so forth, at the group, structural, or institutional level. For example, you can push for extending the privileges that the nuclear family receives, such as being able to extend one's health care coverage to those who are not one's spouses or children, or by ensuring that everyone can receive access to affordable health care regardless of their relationships. If structural changes seem out of reach, what are the communities you're involved in, and how can you challenge amateurnormativity in them? After you come up with some other possibilities, look up concrete avenues for you to take action. Pause here to write, record, or think about your response. Post-reflection. How do you feel now about amateurnormativity? Have you started to see things differently? What are some aspects of challenging amateurnormativity that you will include in your life? And what things do you still find difficult? What emotions did you encounter when going through the exercises? If you completed part one, a beginner's guide, take a moment to compare your previous reflections to your current reflections. What growth have you noticed in yourself? Pause here to write, record, or think about your response. Sources and narratives. The list of sources and narratives cited in this guide are included in the video description or at the end of the text version of the workbook. Credits, developed by Graces of Luck and Erica Mulder. Feedback and suggestions from and edited by Kelly Gray, Anonymous, and Ruth Ann. Acknowledgement, 
the creation of this guide wouldn't have been possible without the help of the great materials cited in the sources and narratives a thank you to these individuals and organizations who shared their experiences and created content on these topics thank you thank you for completing this guide and workbook Hopefully you have learned something new and will apply these to your life to challenge Amazon Motivity.